Hello, Lighthouse family and friends. Thank you for joining us tonight for a special uh, time of Bible study, if you will. I'm so honored tonight to have a friend of ours and a friend of our church, Pastor Mitchell Bland from the Sanctuary United Pentecostal Church in St. Louis, Missouri. Pastor Bland is going to speak to us here for the next few moments about the anxiety that many are dealing with right now in our country. Enjoy. We are living in unprecedented times, they will say, or uncharted waters, a time like no other, and all types of different descriptions that people will give us and that we'll hear from time to time. They sound quite ominous to, to be truthful, and just the way we talk about this time in which we live elicits sometimes a little bit of fear and, and uneasiness. Truthfully, unless you have taken a very long nap and just woke up from like several weeks ago, or somehow you have excluded yourself from the world or isolated yourself completely from the entire world, you understand and you know that we are in a pandemic. A state of emergency has been called and it's rattled everyone and probably rightly so. We have a problem and we are facing things we have never faced before. So my endeavor here is to talk to you and help us with this feeling of, of sadness, this feeling of gloom or uh, maybe sprinkle that with a little bit of hopelessness, add a pinch or two of confusion and a gallon of worry dumped in on that, and you have what's a pretty good recipe for good old-fashioned heaping of anxiety. And so I want to come from two different angles the best that I can, the first being, again, the natural, the psychological viewpoint, and then I want to look at this all through the lens, though, of a spiritual perspective the best that I can. It's also my hope that I can leave some some, just some different things along the way, uh, some, some practical advice that maybe at times you can grab a hold of and steady yourself in these uncertain times. So, so let's begin. This, this idea of anxiety, and let me do it like this, anxiety or stress or worry. Psychology Today, it has an article and it tells somewhat the difference between uh, worry, which is said more of a head you, you think through things and anxiety is more of something you feel and stress causes a lot of this. But for the sake of our talk, the time will be together here these next few minutes. I want to just kind of bunch those together. I don't want to try to separate those. I just want us all to be on the same page. So whether you're saying you're anxious, you're stressed out, it's causing anxiety, you're worrying about stuff. We're, I'm just want to uh, lump those all together the best that I can. So I believe there is something that we all do. But it seems, for whatever reason, I guess I could say I've been blessed, but I think I've been more cursed with this and have attained every certificate for achievement in this, and that is making up scenarios in our mind at lightning speed that never will happen or very slim chance of happening. When I'm counseling people, many times I will tell them, be careful of the mind monsters. And what I mean by that is just our mind begins to think of certain things and we go crazy and build these scenarios. Let me give you a quick example. Let's say I heard my dad is sick, okay? And, and that's all that I hear. Let me give you a background so we are on the same playing field. Last year, my dad's very healthy. Last year, he had a cancer scare and they did some chemo, radiation, and a surgery. And thank God he's cancer free. We praise God for that. But that's where we're going to start. And then I hear that my dad is sick. So if I'm not careful, my mind monsters can go something like this. They will go something like, oh, dad is sick. I, I hope it's not the cancer coming back. Oh, if it is, maybe they'll be able to give him just a little more chemo or radiation, maybe a small surgery. I hope he gets the same doctor if he's able to because he knows his case already. But, oh, man, it doesn't matter what doctor he gets. I know that the chemo suppresses your system. It's hard to get that out of your system. And so his system's probably uh, suppressed, and he's a little bit older, and now he's going to have to go in and out of these hospitals and this COVID-19. I'm, I'm worried about that. And so I wonder if he'll be able to go and not, uh, not contract this corona, coronavirus. And then I'm wondering, well, what mom's going to do with this? If something happens to dad, I guess we could sell that. And you understand. And I'll pause there and just say it goes from zero to nothing very, very, very quickly. And so this whole idea of taking it to extreme, these whole, this whole concept of mind monsters getting away from us. So in this case, I could simply call home and just say, hey, how's dad? Oh, he had a heartburn, upset stomach, he took some pride sack and some Tums. He's good. Well, that cleared the air. So please don't misunderstand me by saying you can just take two Tums and everything in the world's going to go away. I'm not saying that. But what I'm 
trying to bring up and stress right now is I'm just wanting us to understand how something that's true, for instance, in this case, my dad is sick, I can take that and turn it into absolute worry and stir it up in my mind so much that I begin to feel anxious about that. And if, I, if it keeps going in this downward spiral, it literally can paralyze me with fear. It can steal my joy. It can steal my hope and my faith, okay? So that would, remember that these mind monsters can get away from us. I need to say another thing here. There are real disorders, okay? There are such things called panic disorders and anxiety disorders, and there are people who suffer from depression. It is a medical condition. There are people also who suffer from bad eyesight or limited eyesight or high blood pressure or high cholesterol or sugar diabetes. So if your body is not properly producing adequate certain neurotransmitters like dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine, things like that, you are going to suffer. Or if your body does not metabolize those correctly, those those, uh, neurotransmitters, you're going to suffer from depression or from anxiety. The same if your pancreas is not creating enough insulin, you're going to suffer from sugar diabetes. It's just part of what happens when our body breaks down. We believe God can heal, absolutely, but until he does, I think we need to use wisdom. What's my point in all this? My point is, take insulin, wear glasses, take antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication until the Lord heals the condition. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, hey, you need to take some medicine for your stomach problems. There's a lot to be said about this here, but I wanted to be compassionate to those who for so long have been told that you just need to pray through and rebuke that depression or anxiety. If we say that, then we also need to tell people they just need to pray through and rebuke their sugar diabetes and limited eyesight. I wanted to bring this up because as I move forward, I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I'm saying here. That somehow if you have faith enough or if somehow you believe God and trust him more, you shouldn't have anxiety or depression. So things I say, yes, can absolutely help you. I believe they can. They can help us all, I'm hoping. But if it is a medical condition, then that is an entirely different level. Jesus healed a man with leprosy and one time, and he said, go show thyself to the priest. In other words, go through the proper channels and get clearance and proof that a miracle had transpired. So if God has healed you, go show yourself to a doctor and get their clearance and documentation of the healing. I don't believe that's lack of faith. I believe that's showing wisdom. You see, I digress and I apologize, but get on one of my soapboxes here. But I wanted to make certain someone who has a medical condition is not being inadvertently wounded by my words or by something I'm going to say here, and, but will find hope in all of these. And here is where the rubber meets the road, okay? The Bible does speak of illnesses. Lady of the issue of blood, it speaks of blindness, it speaks of uh, people that are lame. But it speaks time and time and time again about things like not being anxious and not fearing and trusting God through situations. That's where we sometimes get confused and we lump this all together. There are, hear me out, there are medical conditions and then there are environmental issues that cause us to fear or be anxious or become depressed. Really has nothing excuse me, really has nothing to do with neurotransmitters not working correctly. Our body is responding to stressors on the outside and we're overstimulated or we become overwhelmed and then we become worrisome and we become anxious and stressful, okay? So I'm trying to separate these that we can help each other together, but I want to separate these to the degree of if it is a medical condition, something is broken in your body that's on a completely different level than what I'm talking about. It can help what I'm going to say, but it may not cure it but hopefully I can help everybody today. Let me, ha- let me say one more thing. This is not a news flash, but let me remind you, the enemy of your soul hates you and is out to get you and does not fight fair. I don't care what sickness you have, what you're facing, how poor you are, what's going wrong or right in your life. It doesn't matter. The enemy is going to use that to his advantage. 
Pull open his file drawer and he's going to say how to be a good devil and pull out his job description. He's going to have three words on it. And those three words are kill, steal, and destroy. That's all. That's how to be a good devil. You just do that at all costs. And he's a good devil. He's been at it a long time. And that's what he's working to do to all of us. So if you're feeling sick, he's probably going to remind you you have this coming. Look at your bad lifestyle. Look at what you've always done. Or get you so fixated and worried on that that you can't, you can't do anything else. You are just stuck there. And I'm sure that in some regard, in some way, we have all faced those problems with the enemy of our soul. But now the entire world is in a crisis. The enemy is going to do his very best to wreak havoc through all of this. The situation at hand is people are worried. People are scared. People are sick. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their retirement. We don't know what will happen. We don't know how long this will last. Bottom line, we're all in the unknown. It is very uncertain times. What causes significant anxiety or worry in us is the uncertainty or the unknown. It's all of the what ifs that could happen. There's a lot of research on this subject. I'll, let me talk with one for, about one for just a second from the University of Wisconsin. They did a research and they came with this conclusion. As a rule, they say, humans prefer certainty to uncertainty. It says studies have shown that people would rather definitely get an electric shock now than maybe be shocked later. And in the meantime, they show greater nervous acti uh, system activation. In other words, they're higher anxiety, they're higher stress when waiting for an unpredictable shock. What that's saying is like, do you want shock now or possibly get shock later? And people are like, shock me now. So I know what it feels like, get it out of the way, rather than maybe getting shocked. Because it, it, in other words, it's that uncertainty, it's that unknown. Where people differ is in the degree to which that uncertainty bothers them. None of us like uncertainty. It bothers all of us. But again, we differ in the degree to which it bothers us. That's why some have ulcers over this and some are just mildly concerned about it. But let's face it. We do like to be in charge of things. We do like to know things. We like to be in control of our own lives, especially some of us choleric gold, lion, number eight, whatever personality test you use, we really like to be in control. This is hard on us. It's hard on everyone. As I turn a corner here, I want you to hear me out because I, I don't want you just to turn it off and say, oh, I've heard this before. I want you to understand that Jesus is always the answer. Jesus is still the answer. Probably a dozen times or more you've watched a devotion or your pastor has said or you've heard on a phone conversation things like, this didn't take God by surprise. He promised he'd never leave or forsake us. He knows the way that I take. God will use us for his glory. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And all of that is exactly true because all of that is based on the word of God. We really need to remind ourselves of these things. But this is real. It is real that you may have lost your job or your income is severely affected. It is real that you're now trying to make your children, <laughs> still educate your children in the home while taking care of the home and keeping it in order while still doing your job. It is real that we're isolated from each other and we're not made to do that. We're made as social beings. It is real we're feeling trapped in our own homes. It is real that people are sick and they are dying. It is real there is very major stresses going on. And let me talk to some leadership and even those in the pastoral role. It is real that we can't care for the people we serve like we want to. It is real that we're concerned about the momentum we had and how are we going to get that back up? And what about that new convert? And what about that person who was just now making a decision for the Lord? And the fellowship that we no longer can cultivate the way that we're going right now. It is real that some of the, some, uh, that some, that the income is significantly less, but the bills are pretty much the same. It is real that people are still getting sick and having babies and supposed to be or passing away or going to the hospital and we can't care for them like we desire. It is real 
the guilt and worry of what in the world am I supposed to do? How can I properly feed the flock of God? How can I teach and mentor and minister to those I lead? And I could just keep adding to the list and getting us more and more worried and more and more anxious and more and more stressed. But this stuff is real. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's out there. This is where we are living right now. Pretty much all of us. So let me get a little preachy here for a second. This type of stuff tries our faith. When you're in the fire or pushed through the ringer, things surface that probably have been masked or covered for quite some time. We have to remember who took care of us before the pandemic, who helped us when everything was going good, who ultimately supplied our needs, who shielded and protected us. It's very easy to stand there in good times, in the peaceful times, and give glory to God and thank Him for His provision and protection and peace. But maybe that is secretly masked by the thoughts of self-sufficiency. I have a good job. We do our best to stay healthy. And I'll keep the peace. I own a gun. Even those times you give glory to God. But maybe we're relying on ourselves a little bit too much. Because it isn't that clear in the storm. It isn't that clear in the fire. It isn't that clear when things are going wrong. And it's not that easy to say, bless the Lord in the darkness. And say, God, I thank you for provision, even though I lost my job. God, I thank you for protection. But a family member has the virus. God, I thank you for peace. But I have control of very little right now in my life. That's where your faith is put on trial. Is he still a good God? Can you still trust and rely on him? Allow me to say another disclaimer here. I'm in no way saying that just because you're worried or just because you're stressed or have anxiety that your foundation is not solid on Jesus. What I am saying is don't let anything that happens in your life be wasted. Now is the perfect time to make sure you're securely on the solid rock. Parable of the two houses in the New Testament. Remember that? The houses looked the same. The houses were built the same. They built the same time. Exactly above the ground, they looked identical. They encountered the same storm, encountered the same flood. What happened was one collapsed, one didn't. One was on sand underneath. One was on rock underneath. The underneath was revealed when the storm hit. It's easy to bless the Lord in the good times. But since it's not the good times... We need to make certain we can still bless the Lord. Just do a heart check. That, that, that's all I'm saying. Another thing I'll mention is it's important to bring every thought into captivity. We have to be careful how we're thinking and what we're thinking and what we're putting in our brains to think about. Because as I mentioned earlier, those mind monsters can go absolutely crazy on us. Whatever you do, don't feed them. Immerse yourself in the word of God. There's strength and power that comes from the word of God. Right now, all over social media, people are doing devotionals. They are doing their live stream and their church services. Grab a hold of that stuff that's available. Fill your mind with godly things. Whatsoever things are true and honest and lovely and virtuous and just and praiseworthy, think on those things. Put those things in your mind. And I understand we want to be informed, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But be very careful. Someone's news feed that everything's Nancy Pelosi's fault or someone's news feed that everything's President Trump's fault or that the China are out to get us, that those probably are not too fair or they're probably not the news feed that you need to go to. Honestly, just go to the source. Go to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Go to a web site that they, the president is actually speaking or the people on co the floor of Congress are actually speaking, then make your own informed opinion. Don't make an opinion based on what somebody else's opinion of what they said is. Another thing we should do, and we should do all the time, but especially now, is pray. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for strength. Ask God for help. 
So often we get caught in a trap that we think we can talk or we can rationalize something enough if we talk it to death or, or we, we can make it better, or we can make it go away. We're not in control of this. It is vital we talk to God about this. He's in control of everything. The Bible also admonishes us about praying in the spirit and with understanding. I admonish you, I encourage you to pray in the Spirit. In other words, talk in tongues, pray in the Holy Ghost. Because of technology, they have done all types of research on this. They can hook people up to a machine and it tells what part of their brain is firing. They've hooked people up and they've had them talk in, in a certain area where the speech comes from is firing. And they'll have them look at pictures of their family in a certain er other areas light up. And they can tell what areas uh, are there, that, their, that their brain is thinking and focusing on. They've done all types of things with these imaging machines. And now because of technology, they're able to do this and they've hooked people up. And they've had them come into a medical facility and they will say things like, go into your prayer language. or We just call it talking in tongues. And people have talked in tongues while being recorded on these. It's this deep communion with God. I'm not talking about battling in the spirit world. I'm not talking about intercession. I'm talking about that refreshing that coming into his presence and basking and being rejuvenated in that beautiful heavenly language. And as these people began to talk in tongues, the imagery on the screens was not a place firing where the language comes from, was not all lit up all over the brain, explosive like dynamite. Their brains went very, very, very quiet. Do you know what they found? The medical professionals, they analyzed this and they said the closest we can come that compares to this is when someone is on anti-anxiety medication. That fascinates me. In other words, anti-anxiety medication calms you down, calms down the nervous system, calms down the brain. And according to these researchers, that's exactly what getting in his presence and talking in tongues does. Might I add the side effects are things like love and joy and peace and rest and refreshing. That is why I tell you, get as close to God as you can. Get in his word. Pray and turn your problems over to God. Talk in tongues. Lay there at night as you drift off to sleep and talk in tongues. Get up and make breakfast. Talk in tongues. Think about God and speak that heavenly language that will calm you down knowing that he has all things in control. Maybe tonight you were hoping for some perfect thing or some magic wand and I'm going to make all this go away or prophesy something to you. I, I'm sorry, I don't have any of that. What I do have is to remind you, we have something certain in uncertain times. Fix your mind on that. Rehash that. Talk about that. Study about that. Read and listen to that. Fill yourself with knowing we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's no shadow of turning. He is constant. He is fixed. He is on the throne. He knows what is happening. Bring your thoughts into captivity. Gird up the loins of your mind. Put on the mind of Christ. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear thou not, for I am with thee, he says. For I am persuaded, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Come unto me, Jesus says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out all fear. And the last verse I leave with you. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. And can we pray together? Jesus, I pray in the name of Jesus, something that I have said tonight, that you would reach to their hearts, that you would plant your word inside of them, that you would give that peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I don't want to sugarcoat this. This is scary stuff. This is uh, things unprecedented. We don't know what's happening. And I know how human nature, we like to things to be known and we like to have things that are certain. And in our entire world, Lord, there's very few certain things right now. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot more questions than answers. No one seems to have the answer. But oh God, help us to remember you are always the answer. You are certain in uncertain times. You know what's going on, Jesus, and we're going to cling to you. We're going to bask ourselves in your word. We're going to get close to you, oh God. We're going to pray in the spirit. We're going to pray with understanding. We're going to focus our attention. We're going to bring every thought into captivity, Lord, so that you can calm us and you can hold us as your dear children. Bless each one, I pray. Keep us close to your heart. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.